Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Faith Church. Um, on behalf of Council and our congregation, we'd like to welcome Reverend Al Kuypers to our pulpit this morning to lead us in our service. He's a regional pastor for the Christian Reformed Church and uh, lives in Hull and will soon be moving to Orange City. Welcome. Some love of God the Father will fill you with hope. And the abiding breath of the Holy Spirit will fill you with overflowing joy. Just invite you then to stand in the presence of our God as we worship Him with heart and voice. Would you stand in the presence of our God? Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Take just a moment to greet one another in the presence of our awesome God.
It's always a joy to watch the children participate in worship and how they really get into some of those songs and just trying to imagine them marching through the wilderness, maybe even imagining how they might have marched together with the people of God in the Old Testament scriptures, marching together as the children of the Lord. Just invite you now for a few moments to imagine yourself in the presence of God and to lay your heart and mind and all that you are and all that you have before him in a time of confession. Like the people who greeted Jesus as he entered Jerusalem and later pronounced, crucify him, we are fickle people who often deny Christ in our thoughts, in our words and deeds. Remembering the events of Jesus last week, help us now to see ourselves for what we are, sinners in need of a Savior, a Savior, praise God, that we have in Christ. In honesty and hope, we confess now our sins to the Lord. O Lord, who on this day entered the rebellious city that later rejected you, we confess that our wills are as rebellious as Jerusalem's, that our faith is more often show than substance, that our hearts are in need of cleansing. Have mercy on us, Son of David, Savior of our lives. Help us to lay at your feet all that we have and all that we are, trusting you to forgive what is sinful and to heal what is broken, to welcome our praises, and to receive us as your own. Amen. And hear now these words from Psalm 118. Let those who fear the Lord say, He said, love forever. And out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. In Christ, God answers us and sets us free. In Christ, we are forgiven and set us free. The words of assurance from Psalm 118, which were just read, remind us of God's steadfast, enduring love. It is this love that we reflect on in our next song, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love. Written in 1875 by Samuel Trevor Francis, it is a testimony to the magnitude, power, eternity, and preciousness of the love of Jesus. The second line of this hymn describes the love of Jesus as vast, unmeasured, boundless, free. In our finite, physical world, it is difficult to genuinely comprehend this concept of unmeasured depth and breadth. The ocean is the largest thing on earth. Its deepest point is deeper than the highest mountain on earth, yet God's love is deeper still. Even though we can see just a small fraction of the sea from any point on the coast, we know that the ocean has boundaries. In contrast, God's love is boundless and free-flowing. May the words of this song help you meditate on Christ's sacrificial love during this coming week. This morning we will be singing an updated version of this old song, complete with a chorus and new music. Please stand and remain standing for the prayer following this song.
Please pray with me. Father, we praise you for the love you lavished on us through your Son. We thank you that this love surrounds us at all times and in all places through the work of your Spirit. Give us an increasing awareness of your love for us. Give us the grace to trust you completely. And now as we turn our hearts to hear your word proclaimed, enable us to listen with joy and gladness to your gospel. Amen. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, as Jesus enters Jerusalem in what is we know as a triumphal entry, after all the people had shouted Hosanna to the Son of David, just a few verses later in Luke 19 we read that as he again approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And the question that I invite you to consider this morning, really in this Palm Sunday morning, what does it really mean to follow Jesus? And if you will, turn to your Bibles then to the book of Numbers, to the book of Numbers chapter 9. Book of Numbers chapter 9, and I'll begin to read with verse 15. It's a setting where the people of Israel, the people of God, have been delivered from the bondage of slavery. And they're learning to walk with God, who has promised to lead them all the way into the promised land. And as they learn to walk with God, we see this as a picture that foreshadows the coming of Jesus Christ, who came to deliver us from the bondage of sin. The book of Numbers, chapter 9, I begin to read with verse 15. As we read this, let's pay attention to the repetitions, the repetitions that follow again and again. On the day the tabernacle, the tent of testimony, was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. And wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained encamped. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp. And then at his command, they would set out. And sometimes the cloud stayed only, only from evening till morning, and when it lifted in the morning, they set out, whether by day or by night. Whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days, a month, a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command, they encamped. And at the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. Just invite you to keep your Bibles open to Numbers chapter 9. So the question for Lent and the question for Palm Sunday simply is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? When Jesus says, follow me. What does that really look like? We ask ourselves the question quite often, how can I ever really discover 
what path, what life, my direction, path of life, what direction my life should take. Or we ask ourselves, how does God really lead me in the details of daily life? Or we even ask ourselves, should I go to college? Should I get a job? Should I stay on the farm? Is God leading me into the military, into medicine, into ministry? Or sometimes we even ask, where is God when I face excruciating grief, unbearable pain? Or where is God when I, face a, when I have to make a really tough decision in life? And I would imagine there are many places in Scripture where you can go in pursuing answers to those questions, but our text this morning gives us a revealing picture of how God led his people in their 40 years of wilderness wanderings. With that pillar of cloud by day, that pillar of fire by night, have you ever wondered what that pillar of cloud might have looked like? How high, how tall? A hundred feet? A thousand feet? A mile high? And did it spin? Did it twirl? Did it whirl? Or did it kind of float in front of them, skimming across the ground? And that pillar of fire by night, as God led them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, Exodus 13 says that with this pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, they were able to travel by day, by night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and as long as they followed the cloud, they were safe. So first of all then, following God, following where God leads, requires a humble faith, willing to let God be God. Take a look again at the words of verse 17. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Whenever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. That kind of humble faith requires a willingness to follow where God leads, even when it interferes or is inconvenient to the circumstances of our life. But it's precisely that point that we have a difficulty in understanding the will of God. We would like to have our whole life displayed in front of us. God, what's going to happen in my life? What direction will my life take after I leave school? Where will I be 20 years from now? What's going to happen at the end of my life? We would like to have our whole life displayed in front of us. Lord, what direction will my life take? What direction will I go? What's going to happen? But ordinarily, God doesn't work that way in our life. Ordinarily, God leads us day by day and step by step. The way Jesus calls the disciples, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, come, follow me. And James and John, he says to them, come and follow me. As Matthew records it for us in Matthew 4, what is so surprising, not so much that they followed him, but as Matthew says, they left their boats, they left their nets immediately and followed him. But if you had been one of the disciples and you believed that the one who invited you to follow him was the one who had come to fulfill all your life's dreams and deepest desires, you would have left your nets as well. And if you had heard this call from him who invited you to follow him, from him who had created all things, if you had heard that invitation, follow me, you would have known immediately that it was not simply a call to follow a dream, to follow an idea, to follow a cause, but to follow him. Follow me, says Jesus. So have you ever asked yourself, in the circumstances of life, should I keep on doing what I'm doing? Or should I think about pursuing another direction in my life's calling? 
What is God calling me to pursue? Listen again to the words of verse 17. The cloud moved, and they followed. And they followed as long as the cloud kept moving. And when the cloud stopped, they encamped. Don't you wish that following God was that easy? Don't you wish wouldn't it be kind of nice? Wouldn't it be absolutely wonderful if each one of us had kind of a personal cloud, kind of like an Old Testament GPS, half a mile, turn left, three quarters of a mile, turn right. As long as you had a voice telling you where to go, where to turn, what to do, wouldn't that be incredibly easy to follow the will of God? Imagine that for a moment. Imagine that one day you go to work and you happen to see your personal cloud or if you're working the night shift, your pillar of fire moving out the door and you take that as a sign that God is leading you in a different direction of life. One day you go out to the cattle yard. You see your personal cloud on the loading chute and you take that as a sign that today is the day that you need to sell your cattle, bring them to market. Or if you're in college and you have a dozen applications to colleges that, if you're in high school and you have a dozen applications of colleges that you're thinking about attending, and you see your personal cloud hovering over all these applications, and suddenly it settles on your application to good enough university, you kind of know where to go and what to do. Or you wake up in the middle of the night and you see this pillar of fire moving down the street. You take that as a sign that maybe it's time to head down south for the winter months. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be nice if all we had to do was follow the cloud? It's not hard to imagine. The many days, however, it didn't make sense for these people in the Old Testament wilderness. Can you imagine what it was like to wander around in the wilderness for 37 years? In the last four years, it seems like you've just been walking around in circles. Somewhere south of nowhere and three miles from the end of the world. It's hot, dusty, dry. You're tired, you're weary, and suddenly the cloud stops. So you get your tent set up and you, you provide a shelter for the animals. And someone tells you that there's an oasis of watering hole just over the next sand dune. And you say, finally, this is a good place to stop. I hope we stay here for a while. I don't want anything to change. This is good. Maybe you get to a place in your life where everything is just going very well. You're happy. You're settled. You have a good job. Kids are happy at school. You like your neighbors. Your health is good. Say, Lord, my life is just the way that I like it. I just want my life to stay like this for a while. The next morning you wake up and the cloud is moving. You got a mid-college crisis the end of another year of college, you're still asking the question, I still do not know what direction my life is going to take. Or you have a midlife crisis, kind of wondering whether or not your life has any meaning or purpose at all. You have a, suddenly a family crisis, you have a health crisis, suddenly your crowd is moving, you're saying to God, God, what are you doing? My life was so good. Everything about my life was just the way that I wanted it. What are you doing? And God says, we're moving on. If you want to stay close to me, you'll have to keep moving. Whether the clouds stayed, 
the Israelites stayed. Whether the cloud moved, the Israelites moved. Now take a look at verse 22. It's not only sometimes that the cloud moves when it's inconvenient in our life circumstances, but in verse 22 of Numbers 9 it says, sometimes the cloud would stay for a day, a week, a month, a year. I can just see how that might have gone wherever they were camping. How the old people, older people, would kind of do what older people like to do, sit around the campfire, talking about all their wilderness adventures. Weren't we camping here last year? Isn't, doesn't this look familiar? Just talking about things that older people like to talk about. And all the while, the next generation, the younger generation, getting rather bored and restless, just having stayed here for such a long time, saying impatiently, come on, let's move, let's go, right now, let's go. God says, be patient. I'll lead you. I'll guide you. So as you read this account in Numbers 9, we begin to sense what it means to walk with God. For what would happen? What would happen if someone chose not to follow the cloud? You can imagine that in your mind. If the pillar of cloud went north, and you decided that instead you wanted to go south, you'd soon find yourself stumbling awkwardly after the mirages of the desert illusions. Or if the cloud at night decided to move east and you decided, no, I'd rather go west, you'd soon find yourself tripping in the fog, in the fog of dark confusion. To move when the cloud is not moving would be to walk in darkness. And to not move when the cloud is moving is also to walk in darkness. But I'm saying to myself as I read Numbers 9, really? How difficult can it be? All you have to do is follow the cloud. If you have your Bibles, turn with me for just a moment to 1 Corinthians 10, the first five verses. 1 Corinthians 10, the first five verses. Here Paul reminds us that these people, all they had to do was follow the cloud who moved every time the cloud moved and followed wherever the cloud led them. That most of them died in the wilderness. Most of them died in the desert because God was displeased with them. Now I read what Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 10. And I ask myself, and I challenge you to ask yourself this morning, if these people never really learned how to walk with God, and all they had to do was follow the cloud, and if they so spectacularly displeased God in their failure to walk with him as he desired, the question then that I need to ask myself, how can I ever hope to walk with God in a way that pleases him if all they had to do was follow the cloud? And here I am, day after day, just trying to figure out God's will, God's direction. God's plan for my life. Following Jesus then, taking the foreshadowing in Numbers 9, now looking to Jesus. If you have your Bibles, John 8, verse 12. John 8, verse 12. I want you to read, understand, what Jesus is doing in John 8, verse 12. Not long before he suffers the humiliation, being nailed to the cross for the sin of the world, 
John 8, verse 12, probably takes place in the temple courtyard in the evening. As the candles are being lit in the temple courtyard, and as Jesus is standing there, as they're lighting the candles to illumine the courtyard, as they're remembering how God led his people through the Old Testament wilderness, he calls out to them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's saying to them, you are remembering how God led his people by the pillar of cloud and the pillar of night, pillar, pillar of fire through the night. But I tell you, I am not only the light in the wilderness, I am not only the cloud in the desert, I am the light of the world. Or as Jesus says in Luke 9, verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross daily, and follow me. Follow me. Follow me, says Jesus. Follow me, says Jesus, again and again and again. As I consider that this morning, you ever wonder what might have been if your life had taken a different direction? What path would my life have taken if God, if Jesus had not reached down to a rather mischievous high school teenager and touched him with his amazing grace. What direction would my life have taken if I had not been held in check by God's grace? What would have become of my life, my relationships, my sense of purpose and meaning in life if I had been permitted to pursue sinful desires without restraint. Just in application to all of this now, I want you to turn with me to Colossians 3, beginning with verse 1. Colossians 3, beginning with verse 1. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to take up our cross daily and follow him? What does it mean to follow him as the light of the world? Something has to have taken place. Because I and myself stand there with those Israelites in the wilderness and say, Lord, I know you want me to go north. I'm going south. Lord, I know you want me to go east, but I'm going west. I will call out Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I'll call that out one day. Tomorrow, I'm going to call out. I'm going to shout, crucify him. I want nothing to do with him. I do not know the man. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Notice what Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 1. How we are called by Christ to follow him out of this promise, out of this hope, out of this assurance. Since you have been raised with Christ, since you have died, and your life is now hidden in Christ. <clears throat> Can I just challenge you to reflect on the astonishing truth of what that really means. How your whole life Every thought, every ambition, every desire has been crucified with Christ in such a way that with Paul we say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Since you have been raised with Christ, you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. It brings us to the fundamental question for every follower of Jesus. Do you and I really believe that Jesus is so desirable, so good, so satisfying, that we are willing to leave all we have, all we are, in order to follow him? That really is a matter of 
utter urgency because the cost of not following Jesus is devastating. Devastating for ourselves, devastating for our families, for our church, devastating for the world. You know, you've heard the stories that are all around us. We hear the stories of those who are desperately looking to find some meaning and purpose in life. They listen to the voices of the revolutionaries, the voices of the visionaries, the voices of the false prophets, the voices of anyone who promises to give them a meaning and purpose in life, who promises to make life better for them, willing to follow radical extremists of one kind or another. Reminded why it's so critically urgent that we follow Jesus. You died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. But now in Colossians 3, look, take a look at verse 5. Therefore, therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Now notice how Paul reverses the path of following Jesus. He doesn't say, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, and then know what it means that you have died and your life is now hidden in Christ. No. He wants you to know, he wants you to see the hope, the promise first. You died and your life is now hidden with Christ, therefore, Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. So I ask you to take an honest look at your walk with Jesus this morning. Am I, are you, passionately following Jesus with every thought, with every word, with every desire, or the action of your life, or too often finding yourself turning aside into the shadows of unholy, evil desires? For in this dangerous world, everywhere you turn, there's a weapon of darkness aimed at your emotions, at your will, at your reason. Weapons not so, meant so much to scare you, but to seduce you, to entice you, to ensnare you. So Paul says, we must put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature. Take a look at that in verse Sexual, impure, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, and anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. If you have your Bibles open to those lists of evil desires, may I confess to you as you would confess to me. That list, Paul, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Paul, I think I'm doing a pretty good job with all of that. Kind of a pushback of confessing these thoughts, the desires in our life. But now notice, notice in verse 7, where I fall to my knees at the foot of the cross. Paul says, no, you, you used to walk in these ways. You used to follow that cloud you used to follow those little twisting dust devils in the wilderness. And I can remember as a child, probably in a field one day on a farm, seeing a little dust devil whirling around across the field. And how, what a pleasure, what a delight it was to try to be caught up in this little whirling dust devil in the field. Paul says, yeah, that's kind of what it's like sometimes and our desire to walk with Jesus, we get distracted by all these little dust devils whirling around us, not really knowing, taking our eyes off of Jesus. But sexual immorality, impurity, lust, 
evil desires and greed, all the things that we consume within ourselves. But then Paul says, it's not only that, not only that we destroy ourselves by all that we take in, by all the evil desires, but it's also how we lash out to those around us, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. If you are married, or single, frustrated in a relationship in which there is little affection shown or absence of tenderness or if even in a situation, circumstance of life you find yourself, there is no one to embrace, with whom to embrace or be embraced. Paul says, put to death, put to death all the evil desires and thoughts in verse 2, set your hearts above. Set your mind on things above. Don't even let the thoughts come into your mind. Don't let them even enter the door of your heart. Put them to death. Crucify them at the foot of the cross. And if you're inclined to anger, rage, malice, and slander, if you've been overlooked, belittled, misunderstood, or abandoned, don't let the thoughts of slander and rage enter your heart, enter your mind. Put them to death. And then verse 12, Colossians 3. Clothe yourself. There's various ways that that is explained, described throughout the letters of Paul. Clothe yourself with Christ. Clothe yourself with the fruit of the Spirit. Here it is. Clothe yourself with gentleness, compassion, humility. The point is, clothe yourself with Christ. So what does it mean to put to death evil desires and follow Jesus? How do we do that? The answer is mainly that in ourselves we are unable to resist the thoughts and even the actions that come out of evil desires. But even so, we should be able to say no, to offer at least some resistance. But Paul says the answer is mainly as we desire to put on Jesus Christ. That is, that we don't hang him around our neck as, a, as, as an attraction, as a nuisance, as a burden, but rather that we surround ourselves with every thought, every word, everything, everything that belongs to Christ, that we surround ourselves. And we call to mind the words of God that deepens our faith in Jesus that we call to mind the promises of God that deepens our hope in Jesus, that we call to mind the beauty of Christ that deepens our love for him. And so this morning, as you hear the echoes of a Palm Sunday crowd, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna to the highest. And we clap our hands and we sing our songs, we are marching, we are marching. We are marching. Only to know that the next day the same crowd is, is, is shouting, crucify him. And so this morning I put the challenge in front of you that as you seek to follow Christ, as you walk with him, it is he who has created all things, by, the, the, in whom all things have been created for him and by him. The very one who offers you the breath of fresh faith in Christ, who offers you new hope in Christ, and who provides for you an embracing love of Christ in every way. And I don't know where you are in your circumstances of life. Maybe you've got a little dust devil whirling around. Maybe you've got some sinful habits that you're struggling with, wrestling with. I just challenge you in your mind, imagine, Jesus is saying, follow me. And you're saying, no, I want to go in this direction, in this path. 
And Jesus says, no. That only leads to death. That only leads to self-destruction. Follow me. And Simon and Andrew, James and John, they left their boats. They left their nets immediately. And they followed him. So the question is again, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And the challenge is, is that where you are this morning? Let's bow before him in prayer. Father in heaven, all they had to do was follow the cloud. All we have to do is listen to Jesus. How hard could that have been to follow the cloud? How easy is it for us to listen to Jesus? O oh Christ, in our hearts, in our mind, in our thoughts, we have died to whatever belongs to our earthly nature. And we are now hid in you. No longer do we follow the cloud, but we are in Christ, transformed, born again, as sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ. In him we pray. Amen. The Santa sing, Guide me, O my great Redeemer. Prior to prayer this morning, uh, I would like to just remind the congregation of some opportunities for service. Uh, please sign up as soon as you can to work at the Community Unity Meal on Thursday, April 9. And secondly, uh, please sign up or contact Jeff Nibelink today um, to volunteer 
to clean new rooms at SCCS uh, on, on Saturday morning, April 11. That'll be prior to the trail raiser supper event there that evening. At this point, we'll have a congregational or intercessory prayer uh, followed by a moment for missions uh, presented by the Scott Halstein family. And then um, during the offertory, we'll have a video um, portraying the experience of the Croc team. And the deacons will come forward at that time to, have your, to receive your offerings. So would you please join me now in an intercessory prayer for Palm Sunday, to which I have added petitions for our congregation's particular concerns. O oh God, whose gracious, deep, deep love for us embraced that long and lonely journey to the cross, gather us close to you in these days when again we make that journey in meditation and, rec and recollection. Help us to contemplate again the way taken by our Savior, the false charges against him, the fear and flight of the disciples, the kiss of betrayal, the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and in such contemplation, give us courage to face those times in our own lives when he received the same at our hands. Yet help us also remember that you have gone before us. So we look to you for compassion and forgiveness, knowing you are able to save. When we are weak, make us strong. When hurt and resentful, make us forgiving. When defeated and discouraged, make us hopeful. Keep us from asking for mercy without giving it ourselves. Keep us from praying for your kingdom, but never working for it. In this week, deepen our faith by your matchless grace. We pray that you would heal and bless Emily, who is receiving treatment at Children's Hospital in Omaha, and be with her mother, who is attending her there. Heal and bless Bob Palama Sr. and Kathy Van Clay, and Judy Terhar and Florence Mahaffey, who are recovering from injuries that they have experienced recently. Be with others in our congregation who are recovering from surgeries or who are undergoing medical treatments or are in the process of considering options for treatment for themselves or for their children. We pray for Rochelle that she may sense your presence near her in this week. Help her and her family to experience your grace and provision in her difficult situation. In this week, as we particularly remember your suffering and sacrifice completed for each of us, may she and all of us know and rely on the victory of your resurrection in her circumstance. And Lord, this week we've heard of other families in trauma and struggle. We ask that you would bring restoration and shalom to the, these families in our area. We pray that you would comfort Mike and Renee Kalkoven and family in the passing of Mike's grandmother. May they be comforted by your presence and the celebration of your blessings to them through the life that she lived by your grace. Bless James Mahaffey and his family as they gather in Texas and bless his mother Arlena as they wait for you to call her home. Give great joy and wisdom to Devon and Elisa Jansma and DeYoung as they begin their married life, anchored in you to together serve you and follow you. We pray for pastors Dave and Chad and our church staff, for all the classes and Sunday school classes and other classes and their teachers and for the YPS, other groups and their leaders, for committee and council members. 
Bless all of our activities this week so that we may all grow into deeper relationship with you, following you, and into greater readiness to serve your kingdom. In this week, be with our missionaries around the world and here at home, including Pastor Gail and Boon Jun at Sulan Unity, and with Pastor Bernie Hahn, who continues to mentor Gail and to work and serve with the church in Colton. May they all experience your blessings and leading in their work. We pray for the ongoing work of the search committee, and we trust you to bring the pastor of your choosing to this congregation. We ask your spirit to bless the good conversations at our roundtable discussions in the past weeks and help us to discern and to follow you and to do what you are calling us to do as a congregation. Deepen the measure of our gratitude and Christian obedience. Move us who have so much to share with others who have so little. Uphold us when we summon our courage to speak out for the alien and the stranger within our gates and for those long denied dignity and freedom. Guard and guide us through these days of meditation and remembrance. Guard and guide us through all our days until we come at last to that day when all our days and journeys will be gathered into your eternity and we shall be with you forever. Glory be to you, O God. Amen. This year, our family had the opportunity to go to the mission trip in Croc, Mexico. We would each like to uh, share a experience that is both meaningful and memorable with you. Um, what I liked about Croc is just playing soccer and catch with the frisbee with all the kids and seeing their happy faces. And then just knowing that they go there just to learn about God and play some activities. Uh, one of the things that we did while we were there is we'd have uh, devotions three times a day in the morning, midday, and then evening. And uh, that really stood out to me when at evening we'd just look back at our day and look where we saw God. And I just really could feel God in everything that we did and during that prayer. So while I was in Croc, uh, I got the privilege of working on our sewer line for our <laughs> dormitories. So me and a bunch of guys, we worked on that the whole week, and we got it done. That was a lot of hard, smelly work. So um, One of the first days that we were there, the devotions that we had was on First, <clears throat> first Corinthians, um, the, when it talked about one body. Um, and all of us have many gifts. And that was very evident to me while we were there. First of all, in our team, um, yeah, a lot of us knew of each other, but not knew each other very well. And we had, yeah, Callie and Brad and Clark, they were willing to navigate the vans through the Mexico traffic, big vans with 23 people in with two uh, big trailers behind. Um, you get Helen and Jill, BJ, their skills of, um, yeah, their painting expertise and lining all of that up, that was fantastic. And then all the kids that were willing to do whatever we asked them. And um, also, yeah, we had Kurt and um, um, Henry that were willing to play cards with my boys for 26 hours in a van, so that was fantastic, keep them entertained. Um, so that was one way that I saw, yeah, many gifts that were evident. But also probably how um, yeah, the people that before us went there with teams um, that were willing to make house or build houses and the work of Kurt and Emily Ridema in years before. So we were able to reap some of the, some of the benefits of the things that they did. Um, the other, probably the neatest way that the one body, many gifts came together was just the fact that all of us were together 
um, there with people that look different than us, talk different than us, but we could spend time together knowing that we all serve one God. I think the biggest thing that I took away from going to Croc was just the fact that by working there and spending time there with those people, it was so fulfilling and you could tell that the things that we did there, you felt like it actually made a difference in someone else's life and it was just a really um, good experience to have. Brad often speaks about the uh, fingerprints of God and uh, that's something I wanted to talk just briefly about. Um, first of all, from uh, the outpouring of support from Faith Church, uh, we covet your prayers and, and we sense those prayers. The overall, the overwhelming turnout at tip night, I couldn't believe how many people from Faith like to go to Pizza Ranch. Um, the supplies and the, the tools that were given, um, we had, we had so, so many things given that we needed and uh, it's hard to believe how many of those tools we actually put to use while we were there. The many words of encouragement and um, even feeling God's presence when uh, a very difficult situation at the border uh, actually gets worked out quite smoothly. Um, another way we see we saw God work is the, uh, the determination and the willingness of five young men from our church uh, to tackle an unbelievably dirty and undesirable project. Um, they did this for, for two and a half, three days without even a word of complaining. And I, I cannot give you words to describe um, the, the difficultness and the task that was at hand. So I give those five guys a lot of credit. A uh, couple meaningful things for me. Um, probably the, the most meaningful thing was uh, I heard we have home visits coming up. And home visit, boy, this does not sound too good. Uh, we're going to meet our family, they're going to break us into groups, and they're going to pair us with a, a family in Mexico, in that community. And we're going to go visit that family in their home. That does not sound very good. So we're going to meet with a family we don't know, in a home we don't know, uh, and they don't speak our language, um, we don't speak their language. How is this going to go? So uh, we were paired as a family. We went to another family that had four children and oldest son about early 20s and three daughters uh, from 10 to 19 years old and with the help of an interpreter we had a wonderful experience an unbelievable experience and we soon realized how similar our lives were um, the things that are important to us church family that your kids get along school jobs they were the exact same things that were very important for them and although we live in different countries, and we have different skin color, and we have different languages, um, it was very evident, uh, even with the extreme range of economic status between their family and our family, it was very evident that we all serve the same Lord and Savior. Thank you, Faith Church, and Brad and Helen and family, and, and everyone who makes uh, an opportunity like this possible. Uh, we created memories we'll carry for a lifetime. Thank you. Set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we may. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now.
May the amazing grace of Jesus Christ fill you with peace. May the awesome love of God the Father fill you with hope. And may the abiding breath of the Holy Spirit fill you with overflowing joy. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.